On today's show, we have a really cool guest. His name is Brian Height. He has a YouTube channel and blog called Sue Genis Brewing. This blog and YouTube channel gives you very detailed instructions on what it takes to create your own homebrewing yeast lab at home and all of the materials you would need to do so today on Homebrewing DIY. recipes and taking good notes are two of the key fundamentals of making great beer. This is one of the first things that you learn when becoming a new brewer. I started taking notes on a sheet from my extract kit and then quickly moved to brewing software. I've tried many different types of brewing software and then I found Brewfather. This is the one piece of software that you need for recipes and very detailed brew day notes as well as fermentation notes. Brewfather also integrates with some of the topics that we discuss on the show like the till hydrometer, the ice spindle, and ferment track. You need no other piece of software than Brewfather. One of the best parts of Brewfather is that you can try it for free. All you need to do is head to our website, homebrewingdiy.beer, and click on the Brewfather banner to sign up for free today. Once again, that's homebrewingdiy.beer, and sign up for Brewfather today. Keeping a clean brewery is the key to making great beer that doesn't get contaminated. Do you use a glass or plastic carboy for your fermentation? Did you know that getting your carboy clean can be tough, especially removing the cruisin ring? Even with traditional carboy cleaning tools, it can take a lot of time and not get your carboy completely clean. Well, today there's a new tool that can easily clean your carboy and do it fast, and that tool is called a scrubber ducky. Scrubber duckies are a new magnetic carboy cleaner that are easy to use and get the cleaning results required in brewing. Drop a magnetic scrubber into your carboy and be able to scrub away all of the grime in that hard to clean cruisin. They are no match for scrubber duckies and you can get yours today at scrubberduckies.com. Once again, head over to scrubberduckies.com. Have you ever wanted to make a podcast? Do you have a subject you want to discuss with listeners? Do you even know where to start? Well, if you want to make a podcast and you want to get started now, I could not recommend Anchor enough. Anchor is the easiest way to make a podcast. Anchor gives you everything you need in one place for free, which you can use right from your phone or computer. Creation tools allow you to record and edit your podcast so it sounds great. They'll distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard everywhere. Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and many more. And you can easily make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. Hey, look, I shopped around for a place to post my podcast, and Anchor was the easiest, most streamlined experience you could ask for. So if you're looking for a place for your new podcast, download the Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Once again, Download the Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. And welcome back to Homebrewing DIY, the podcast that takes on the do-it-yourself aspect of homebrewing. Gadgets, contraptions, and parts, this podcast covers it all. On today's show, we're talking to Brian Height of Sue Genis Brewing. We're going to talk about all of the steps that you need to take to create your own home yeast lab. But first, I'd like to thank all of our patrons over at Patreon. It's because of your support that this show can come to you week after week for free. Head over to patreon.com forward slash homebrewing DIY today and give it any amount. Any support is truly appreciated. We currently have a special going on right now that if you give it the $1 level, you'll get not only a logo sticker mailed to you, but we'll also give you access to our RSS feed that is ad-free and early release. 
cool thing is this week i am actually getting this episode out early you'll probably be hearing this on tuesday versus on thursday so pretty exciting stuff and definitely worth giving over at patreon also if you give it the five dollar level we're going to give you a really great gift from scrubber duckies i only have one left so whoever is the next five dollar patron is going to be the last one that i have and speaking of new patrons, I'd like to thank Mike McCourt for signing up at the $5 level. I sent his Scrubber Duckies off on Monday, and I'm super excited to see what he thinks and if he likes them. So Mike, thank you for giving at Patreon. So if you'd like to support the show, head over to patreon.com forward slash homebrewing DIY. Another way you can support the show is by heading over to Apple Podcasts or Podchaser.com and writing us a review. Your reviews help others find this show and it gives me great feedback on improving the show. So please head over there and write us a review. Also, if you have any feedback, we'd love to hear from you. You can always shoot us an email at podcast at homebrewingdiy.beer. Once again, that's podcast at homebrewingdiy.beer. And I'd love to maybe read your feedback on the air. Just send us an email. I'd love to hear from you. The last way you can support the show is to head to homebrewingdiy.beer, our website, and use our sponsor links. You can buy a new brewing software such as Brewfather or do your shopping at Adventures in Homebrewing. And in doing so, you're going to let them know that we sent you and they're going to give us a little bit of a kickback. So please support the show by using our sponsor links. First thing I'd like to talk about is the fact that I'm sure it's not a surprise to everyone that most people in the United States right now are staying home just because of the COVID-19 outbreak that's happening here in the United States. And we are officially in the middle of a global pandemic of COVID-19. But uh, I'd like to talk a bit about a couple of things. I, I ran a bit of a Twitter poll and I actually talk about it a bit with Brian in our in our conversation today. But during that Twitter poll, I, I asked some people, and anecdotally, I'm also asking my friends, are you homebrewing more now that you're kind of stuck at home? And I found that the answer is emphatically yes. A lot of people are homebrewing more. And randomly here in Colorado, we have a couple of local homebrew shops that if you place an order with them or call it in online, they'll actually bring you your ingredients and leave it contact free on your porch so that it's easy for you to get what you need. So pretty exciting stuff. And I'm really excited that there's enough homebrewers out there that are supporting these shops and helping keep them open. Another cool thing that's happening here in Denver around it is that there's another local podcast here that is specific to do with the craft beer industry mainly focused on actual craft breweries on the pro side, not so much on the homebrewing side, but there's a a local podcast here called Unfiltered, and they're actually doing a really cool, it's called the SIP Beer Festival or the Shelter in Place Beer Festival, where they're on April 11th going to do an online beer festival and all of the ticket sales and all of the merch and even donations to the festival are going to support the staff of local craft breweries. Uh, if you have a local craft brewery and you're not being distributed in grocery stores, chances are right now it's really tough to sell beer because you're only doing so to go. And, and, and even if you're selling food, it can only be to go. So the Unfiltered Podcast is doing this shelter-in-place beer festival If you head over to their website, SIPBeerFest.com, you can get more information on tickets or ways to donate to the festival or how to even participate in it. So head on over to SIPBeerFest.com. Once again, that's SIPBeerFest.com. In unrelated beer news, in my personal brewery, I had a really cool experience on Saturday where a small group of us from the Old Town Mash Paddlers Beer Club, we actually got together and did our own kind of impromptu beer meeting where we did a no contact beer exchange within the club so that we could all have each other's homebrews. We only tasted a couple homebrews in this format. And then we did a Google Meet video call and tasted and actually 
almost kind of had like a happy hour just as a group of us. And it was a really, really good time. If you have friends that are home brewers and you trade or swap beers or members of a club, doing an online beer club meeting was a really fun experience. So highly recommend you being able to do that if you can. But in my own brewery, I had a couple of beers that I had given out as bottles and I had them on tap and was going to drink them as part of the meeting, went to go and pour myself a beer. And as soon as I did, I was out of CO2. I've had a 20 pound CO2 tank and I haven't had to fill it since 2017 because it is kind of a lot of CO2 for a home brewery scale, but eventually it does round out run out and apparently that happened in the middle of a pandemic so now i'm trying to figure out what i need to do to get my co2 tank refilled Uh, i feel like every week i've been talking about my little homebrewing mistakes it's kind of embarrassing well let's uh jump into today's conversation where we're talking to brian height about doing your own home yeast lab I'd like to welcome Brian Height to the show. He's the author of the Sui Genis Brewing blog, and he also has a great YouTube channel called Sui Genis Brewing. Welcome to the show, Brian. Thank you for having me. Well, I have to personally say that for me, I found you through your YouTube channel and a, a, probably about three or four years ago. And at that time, it really inspired me to create my own home yeast lab because of your series, your own home yeast lab made easy. I'd like to go into a bit of maybe of your history and, and how you set up your yeast lab, maybe your first time. And, and let's talk a bit about that. Sure. So I started uh, way back in the mid 1990s Uh, back in those days, at least here in Canada, uh, home brewing wasn't like it is now where you could just go online and get what you wanted. You know, you'd go to your local homebrew shop and, you know, you'd go in with, with a recipe list to make a Pilsner and you'd come up with the ingredients for a uh, porter. And that's just because, you know, what they had on hand in terms of yeast and hops and stuff is what was there. And that's what, what you brewed with. And so I was uh, a young university student. I was taking courses on microbiology. And in one course, we were taught how to sort of culture and store bacteria and so I went and I, I talked to the prof, told him what I was doing, and uh, she got really excited. And, and I left her office about an hour later with a whole bunch of test tubes and uh, some agar and some recipes for some media I could try. And I started at that point to bank some yeast. And so uh, in those days, I, I used a method called slanting, and I, I do have a video on that. And um, for probably four or five years, I kept about a, a dozen or so yeasts uh, in my fridge on slants, sort of the, the common ones that I used. And uh, it was at about that point, I actually started working on my PhD uh, and I got access to obviously better lab equipment and, and better techniques. And that's when I really started to begin collecting yeast, not just maintaining a, a handful of, of strains. And so I started using freezing as a way to store my yeast uh, and you know, today my collections grow into something in the neighborhood of 400 uh, different yeasts and mixture of yeasts and, and other brewing organisms like lactobacillus. That's a very large yeast bank to maintain in your house. And are, are you doing that with your home equipment or are you using lab equipment from work or something like that? So mostly at home. Uh, however, I do have uh, backup stocks at my work uh, stored in a in a minus 80 degree Celsius, which I think is about a minus 120 Fahrenheit freezer. So that's uh, uh, the best way to store yeast if you have access to it, obviously, because uh, frozen like that, they're good in theory for hundreds of years. But all of my working stocks I keep at home, uh, and that's what I work from 99% of the time. Yeah, and one of your video series on your YouTube channel specifically talks about capturing wild yeast and some techniques to do so. Why don't you talk a bit about if I were never thought about being doing any type of collection of yeast, how relatively easy it is to to capture your own wild yeast from your own backyard? Uh, so capturing wild yeast 
I mean, it can be as easy or as hard as you want it to be. Um, you know, the, the simplest way to capture wild yeast is just to cool ship a beer. So if, uh, you know, in my case, I brew on a, a propane burner out in the yard. So I do this a couple of times a year, literally at the end of the boil, shut off the propane, leave the lid off your pot and just walk away and leave it till the next morning. Uh, and over the night, you know, bugs will drown in it, stuff will get blown into it. And that's going to carry in the wild yeast that will then start a ferment. Um, if you live in a rural area like I do, or if you're in a city where you have raccoons running around, you might want to put a, a barbecue grating on top, but you do want to make sure it's open enough that bugs and stuff can get in. And then the next morning, just transfer it into a carboy, put a narrow lock on top. And if in two weeks or so, you start to see signs of fermentation, you're probably good to go. Uh, but expect to wait at least a year before you drink that, because it does take a while for those types of beers to mature to a point where um, there's something you'd want to consume. And even then, you're probably going to want to look at adding fruit or blending it with another beer to get something that's really enjoyable. And, and those types of mixed fermentations are going to have flavors that are going to be more kind of saison, lactobacillus, brett kind of funky type of flavors, right? Exactly. Um, I mean, this is how traditional lambics are made. Don't expect to get something like that because lambics get a lot of their character from being blended across multiple sort of barrels, multiple different cultures. When you do one of these on your own, they tend to be fairly one dimensional. So I've had some that just go incredibly sour. I've had some that get, you know, really that sort of strong, funky note. Uh, which is why usually you need to blend them or add fruit or something when when they're done. Because by blending them, you know, you could take a really sour one and, and mix in a funky one and come up with something a little more interesting. But uh, they do tend to be definitely either towards the sour end or towards sort of the phenolic uh, earth notes and leather and stuff like that character. Now, let's say I wanted to have maybe a collected yeast, wild yeast strain that I I had and wanted to save for later, what would that process look like? I mean like a single strain or a mixture? I, I would say you're going to get a mixture if you collect something out of your backyard, right? Generally speaking, yep. Yeah. And then I know that part of your, your series is talking about maybe isolating a single colony and trying to isolate it down to getting a strain. What, what does that process look like? Yeah, so that process it is actually a process that I think people uh, think are is really complicated, and it's actually not. And um, actually, the whole genesis of that your home yeast lab made easy series was because I was trying to explain these things on forums, and people didn't believe me. So I'm like, fine, I'll just make a stupid video, and you can see how it's done, and it's actually pretty easy. Uh, and so the first thing you want to start with is something that tastes good, um, because you're not going to have a very good chance of success if you just sort of grab any random wild ferment. Uh, but if it already tastes good to start with, then there's probably something in there worth isolating. Uh, and usually the first step in then getting that something good out is you do what's called a streak plate. And so this is where you would take a Petri dish with a, an agar in it that yeast will grow on. And uh, I don't know, explaining this over, over audio might be a little difficult, but basically uh, what you do is you, you take a little loop and you, you take a little bit of that yeast solution and you spread it on one corner of the plate. And then you take um, that loop and you sterilize it in a flame and then you sort of cross it back over where you put those yeast down and then streak that out onto another uh, sort of quarter of the plate. Um, and then you just repeat that process a couple more times. And so every time you sort of flame your loop, you sterilize it. And then every time you pass the loop over your previous streak, you pick up a little bit of the yeast from there, but not a lot. And what that ends up doing is diluting out the yeast. So when you grow that up, that first streak you did will just be a dense layer of yeast. And the second streak will probably be a slightly less dense layer of yeast, but still pretty dense. And then somewhere between that third and fourth streak, you'll start to get single individual colonies of yeast. And when you have a single colony of yeast, that actually grows up from a single cell. So you know if you've got a, a single colony growing off by itself, that that's a pure strain of yeast. And it came, you know, in that entire colony is essentially a clone of that initial yeast. And so once you've done that streak plate, you're going to have 
you know, probably 20, 30 different colonies of yeast on there. And then you can start doing little miniature ferments. Uh, I usually do them in wine bottles because it's a convenient size and you can get uh, bungs that fit them quite nice with an airlock. And I'll just, you know, five or six at a time, do little test ferments and see if I can't find one that I like. And if I do, you can just scale it up like any other yeast using a starter and brew a beer. Yeah. It, w one of the techniques that I used was I would start with my little like 10 mil test tube and start growing up from there until it got to a, a larger volume to where I could actually really start to test it. Uh, and that, that tended to get me where I wanted, even whether it was making a starter for a batch of beer or whether it was testing out different strains of yeast to see if I wanted to try one. But my next question is, is, you know, cleanliness is a, is kind of a big deal. I know that if you're in a lab, you have things like autoclaves for total sterilization. And I think that the, the big thing that I got out of your videos was the fact that you could do a lot of these things at home and you don't need a lot of equipment. What would you say is the basic equipment that you would need for a home yeast lab if you were going to try to start out today? Uh, so if you're not looking to spend much money, you really don't need to buy anything special. Um, for 99% of yeast ranching, just boiling stuff will sterilize it enough uh, for you to use. So really what you're going to want uh, is to have either a Bunsen burner or an alcohol lamp. An alcohol lamp can be made literally out of a spare jar and a, a piece of cotton cloth. Um, and again, I have a video on that if, if someone's wanting to make that or if, if you have a proper Bunsen burner, that's a, that's a little better. Uh, you'll need some Petri dishes, which you can get single-use uh, sterile ones off of Amazon or eBay pretty cheap. Uh, or if you're going to do a fair amount of it, you can get reusable glass ones for a little bit more. Um, some sort of a, a flask for preparing media in. Uh, and then um, a bit of agar, which you can actually get at a lot of uh, Chinese marketplaces. It's used sort of as a, a gelatin equivalent in, in some Asian styles of cooking. Uh, and everything else is a brewery you're going to have around the house. Uh, most of the media, at least that I use, is either made from dry malt extract or from potatoes and sugar, uh, which most of us should have lying around. And if you have all of that, um, you're pretty much good to go, and that'll let you do anything from uh, just banking commercial strains of yeast to capturing and purifying wild yeast. You don't really need anything more than that. Uh, if you really do want to kind of take it to the next step, get an Instapot, and then you can properly sterilize your media. Uh, outside of that, there isn't really any need uh, for anything special for home uh, home yeast lab. But you did mention uh, cleanliness early on, and that part actually is really important. Uh, and again, I have a whole video on this. It's It's probably best if you're trying to get started to watch that. But really, the first step is to find a workplace um, where you can kind of control the airflow because drafts are really sort of the enemy when you're working with plates. You want a room where the air is as still as possible, and obviously you want the room to be relatively clean. And it doesn't have to be a dedicated space. I usually just do it in my kitchen. Um, but you do want to avoid anywhere where there's a lot of drafts, where maybe there's going to be a lot of people walking by while you're working because that'll create drafts. And drafts are what will carry contaminants into your Petri dishes or your tubes as you're working. Yeah, so example would be don't stand under an air vent while you're doing it. That's going to definitely blow contaminants right into it, right? Exactly, or don't work by an open window or or things like that. Another quick question has to do with things like like you said the bunsen burner right uh, i think one of the cool parts for me was what when i first watched you work understanding that like the bunsen burner or the alcohol lamp creates an updraft that allows you to have a sterile working space as long as you're within a certain area of the of the flame why don't you explain to me a bit of how that works yeah so that's really the the magic of a bunsen burner and alcohol lamp so Basically, while they're burning fuel, um, they're doing two things. The first thing is is they're creating hot air, and of course, hot air rises. So that creates over top of the, the burner, uh, whether it's a Bunsen burner or an alcohol lamp, sort of a, a rising column of hot air. And the other thing they're doing is they're consuming oxygen. And if you have a column of hot air 
rising above you, that means that the oxygen has to be coming in sort of from the sides. So you get this movement of air that kind of comes inward across your, your work surface and then rises vertically um, at your lamp or at your Bunsen burner. And so when you're working, if you keep your materials close to that and you don't move too quickly so you're not creating drafts yourself, that flow of error actually protects your samples from becoming contaminated because anything that's in that air, it's not falling down and into your Petri dish or your tubes. It's being drawn up uh, past that flame and then up into the, the air higher up in the room. And so you you get almost like a, a cyclical flow of air where the hot air rises and carry, carries all the contaminants out and then they kind of fall back down to the floor, but they're doing that away from where you're working and then that air gets drawn back in to the flame and carried back up and kind of just cycles around like that. And when working with test tubes, what kind of test tubes do you think are the best ones? It really depends on how much you're planning on doing it. Uh, you can get pre-sterilized single-use plastic tubes um, that actually a lot of people will just re-sterilize with star sand and, and you get multiple uses out of them. That's probably the easiest place to start. Um, what I would recommend people look for are 15 milliliter centrifuge tubes is, is what they're sold as or 14 milliliter snap cap tubes. And either of those will work fairly well as a, a test tube. Alternatively, you can buy proper glass test tubes with either a screw-on lid or a slip-on metal cap. The advantage of those is they're reusable, um, so you can just put them in your pressure cooker uh, and um, use them that way. Uh, and they do make, uh, if you're going to use slants, it is a lot easier to make slants with those glass tubes because you can pressure cook the media right in the tube, and then you just kind of put the tubes on an angle and let it solidify so you end up with a slanted surface. But I generally recommend people stay away from slants. They're, they're a very old school technology. And if you have a home deep freeze, it's a better option for you for storing yeast. Uh, so if all you're going to do is maybe freeze some yeast and, and make some starters, those uh, plastic you know, centrifuge or snap cap tubes are probably your best bet. Yeah, and you did say that slants are kind of an older way of doing it. W what is the more modern way to, to bank those yeasts versus a slant? So the more modern way would be to freeze yeast. Um, freezing has a number of advantages, the main one being how often you have to deal with your culture. Uh, so if you have a, so maybe I should explain quickly what a slant is. So a slant is you, you take a, a test tube and you put a bit of um, media, so that's usually a lower gravity wart with some agar in it so it'll solidify. But when you let it solidify, you don't have the tube standing upright. You have the tube lying at a fairly steep angle so that you get a very large flat surface or a very large surface uh, inside of the tube. And so when you stand the tube up, it's got a slanted solid surface in it. And so when you do slants, you, you streak yeast onto that slanted surface, you let it grow, and then you can cap that and store it in the fridge. And there's a few tricks you can do to extend that lifespan. But Realistically speaking, you're talking three months to maybe a year, year and a half that you can really trust that slant as a, as a way to store your yeast. In a home freezer, that same yeast sample will last you at least three years, if not longer. Uh, and if you have access, of course, to scientific rated freezers, they would last centuries. And the only real trick to freezing is when the yeasts go into the freezer, you want there to be about 20% glycerol by volume uh, in, in that tube along with the yeast. And that'll prevent ice crystals from breaking the yeast open. And so you can get glycerol from a lot of pharmacies. Uh, it's used in soap making and in homemade cosmetics. So you can often find it in, in craft stores. And basically what I do is I will take a, a mason jar uh, a smaller one, one that holds maybe a half cup or so. And I'll mix up a solution of 40% glycerol and uh, the remainder um, just dry malt extract and water, shooting for a final gravity, just around 1020. You don't want too much um, sugar in there. And then I'll pressure cook that to sterilize it. And then when I want to freeze yeast, I'll pour those yeast into tubes. I'll fill the tubes about halfway with yeast slurry, and then I'll top them up with that pressure cooked 
40% glycerol mix, mix it thoroughly, and now I have a tube that's about 20% glycerol, and you just literally toss it into your home deep freeze and let it freeze. And, you know, depending on how you want to manage your yeast, you have a couple options there. Uh, so yeast strains that I use a lot, I can literally thaw one of those tubes. I'll use uh, about a 50 mil tube. And so when in one of those tubes, there's enough yeast that it's essentially the same as a White Labs tube or a Y yeast yeast packet. So you throw it into a starter, a day or two later, it's ready to roll and you're, you're ready to start brewing. Uh, for lesser used yeast, you can actually, uh, I have this on, on YouTube, so it's probably easier to look at the video, but you can take a, a metal loop and scoop a small amount of yeast out of the, fr the frozen tube uh, and put that into a small tube of wort, grow it up, and then move that into a larger uh, flask and grow that up. And in a couple of steps, you can go from that little loop of yeast to a big flask of yeast ready for pitching. And the advantage of that second method is that one tube now can be the basis of dozens, if not hundreds of batches of beer, because you're literally just taking a tiny little scoop out every single time. And so long as you're not letting it thaw and then refreezing it, you know, you're, you're taking the frozen material out and getting it right back into the freezer, that will last you three or more years. And you can get, you know, like I said, dozens or even hundreds of batches out of one tube of yeast. Yeah. And those dozens or hundreds of batches don't have to deal with multi-generations because you're essentially just growing up that same first generation, right? Exactly. And so a lot of times if I've bought a yeast that I know I really want to keep, I'll just make an oversized starter and the tube that I end up freezing in the freezer is that extra uh, yeast from that starter rather than um, uh, rather than waiting till I have yeast slurry after a ferment and all that. And that way you know that you've frozen down yeast that are at a very early point uh, in their their growth cycle. And so they won't have had a chance to drift away from what that original stock was. Yeah. And another aspect of your video, and this is something that is completely new to me is counting yeast through a microscope and the process for doing that. Well, if I were to want to get a microscope and maybe check the yeast vi uh, vitality, what would be the process for me to get into that? <laughs> That's a big question. Um, so actually, one of the most common questions I get through my blog are, are questions about microscopes. And so that spurred uh, a whole series of videos I just finished releasing that it's meant to take someone who's never touched a microscope before and walk them through how to use the microscope, how not to wreck it, how to store it, and then how to do basic things, including yeast counts and viability staining. So the first thing you would want to do, obviously, is get a microscope. Uh, and that's always the challenging part because there's a lot of different microscopes out there. They're built for different purposes. Um, and obviously, budget's always going to be a consideration for someone working out of their home. Um, so, you know, finding a good microscope can take a bit of time. But once you have one, uh, what you'll want to do is, is of course, familiar, familiarize yourself with how to work with it and how to use it. And for the viability staining, it's actually a pretty simple procedure once you're comfortable using the microscope. Uh, and the only thing you need in addition to a microscope to do viability staining is uh, an eyedropper or a pasture pipette, so something where you can sort of make a controlled number of drops of a liquid, uh, and a ceramic dish of some sort. And then you need to get your hands on a dye called Tripan Blue which uh, again, you can just get off of Amazon as a pre-made solution, which is nice. And basically what you do is you take your yeast sample from a starter or whatever yeast sample does you want to look at, and you put one or two drops of that onto a slide, and then you put one or two drops of the Tripan Blue on uh, in, into that as well, so it mixes together. And you, you wanna shoot for roughly the same amount of, of yeast as Tripan Blue. And then you put it under your microscope and you look for cells that stain blue. And anything that stains blue is a dead cell. And anything that's able to keep that dye out is a living cell. And so you can sort of get a rough feel by looking at that, at whether your cells are alive or dead or what portion of them are alive versus dead. So it's a good way if you're trying to assess the health of you know, maybe a yeast you've had stored for a long time, or maybe you made a starter and it's been sitting in the fridge for a month and you want to know if it's still viable. It's a good way to look at, at those kind of things. 
Or even if you just bought an older smack pack from the bargain bin and you really wanted to see if it was worth pitching, that would be another good example, right? Exactly. I, I, I'm i always tempted and never bite the bullet on the old yeast because I'm like, man, am I, is it really worth risking a bad beer over this? Uh, it's only $3. <laughs> Although you, usually a starter will resolve any of those issues, right? If you, you run that smack pack through a starter, as long as there's some viable yeast in there, you'll probably be okay in the end. Yeah, totally. It's just, it's just kind of my, uh, my, my own head playing tricks on me is kind of how that works. Out. Uh, it, I know that there's also the, 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 the technique of kind of counting yeast sales through a microscope and and what would be like the use of doing that well that is um a good way to make sure you're pitching the right amount of yeast and i mean i'll be honest i almost never do that myself uh you know the the starter calculators that are out there that let you sort of estimate how many yeast you're going to get are i think good enough for most circumstances but obviously you know, some people want maybe a little more control than that. In commercial breweries, they're obviously quite concerned with making sure they're getting the right pitch rates. And so that's where counting uh, really becomes a useful thing to do. And again, if you have a microscope and an eyedropper, uh, you only really need one more thing to do yeast cell counting. And that's something called a hemocytometer, which is basically a glass side that has a very fine grid uh, carved into the glass. And it also has a... On either side of that grid is a little glass ridge. So if you put a, a, a thin piece of glass called a cover slip onto that ridge, the ridge will hold it a very specific height above that grid. And so when you put liquid in between that cover slip and the grid, there's a, a very uh, specific volume now above each square in the grid. So you know how many yeasts are in each sort of region of the grid. And from there, you can calculate out the number of uh, yeast in your solution. And I know that sounds horrifically complicated the way I just explained it, but it's actually very easy to do. Uh, the only real challenge is getting a hemocytometer. Uh, until not that long ago, your only real option was to go to a scientific supply company and shell out between three and $500 for one of these things. Uh, but there, there's um, a number of Chinese manufacturers now that they make those clinical grade ones but what they do is they sell the ones that don't meet those clinical standards for three to five dollars a piece so if you're willing to wait a couple of months for it to come in the mail from china you can get one for you know less than ten dollars and i've compared them to the clinical grade one that i have at work and the difference is not that big uh your your counting error as a human will probably exceed the actual error uh in terms of what that cheap hemocytometer does relative to a proper one. Yeah. And to be honest, we're talking about brewing beer and not saving lives. And so, well, depends if, if how much you really <laughs> like beer. Uh, but the idea is that in, in all reality for this particular application, if you're off a little bit, it's not going to be the biggest deal. You're generally going to know that, Hey, this is how many cells I have. Right. Exactly. I mean, you know, if you're trying to pitch an ale, you know, you want somewhere around, what is it, a million per mil? Yeah. And if if you count a million per mil and you actually have, you know, 1.05 million per mil, I mean, that's not going to matter. No, it's not. And you're going to end up with the right right pitch rate anyway. And I think your number one worry is under pitching versus over pitching a little bit, right? Generally, generally speaking, yeah. I mean, yeah. uh, I think in theory you can overpitch a yeast, but I've pitched beers onto entire yeast cake and, you know, in theory been 10 times over where it was supposed to be and the beer was just fine. So yeah. I think overpitching is a challenge. Yeah, I, I think it's more of a challenge versus underpitching can definitely... Sorry about I that. Think, yeah, you're totally cool. <laughs> I think it's I think underpitching is more of a challenge considering that if you underpitch, it could affect flavor even at a homebrew level. Yeah, without a doubt. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's if you make the yeast work harder, it just isn't going to be as good. <laughs> uh, well, let's talk a bit about if I were choosing a microscope, you know, and, and I'll, I'll use an example. I have a six-year-old son. He's geeky uh, like dad and very into science. I've totally bought him a microscope already. Is that going to be a good enough quality microscope for some sort of brewing applications, or am I going to need something a little more useful? 
So without knowing exactly what you bought, it's hard to say. Uh, I bought him like a $60 microscope off Amazon. So this is not anything super fancy. You know, it it depends on what you want to do. Uh, So if all you really want to do is count yeast, which is what a lot of people are are trying to do, that's probably enough. Um, You know, for counting yeast, you do that at relatively low magnification. Uh, Typically, so maybe I should take a step back. So when you're calculating magnification on a microscope, uh, what it is is there's the lens that actually is down by your sample and it'll have a magnification on it and then there's the magnification that's on the eyepiece you look through so you have to multiply those two together so most microscopes will have a 10 times eyepiece and you will have usually about a 10 times um what would be called the objective lens which is the one down by your your sample and for yeast counting that's all you need is the 10 times objective and the 10 times eyepiece so about 100 times magnification which i think pretty much any sort of you know home science type microscope will have even if it is you know just some cheap thing off ebay um where you tend to run into needing fancier things than that is if you're maybe trying to do viability staining where you need to really be able to see cells quite distinctly and also have good color um, uh, fidelity in in the images or if you're doing you know wild brewing or mixed culture fermentations and you absolutely have to be able to see the presence of bacteria and that's when you need to start moving into not necessarily a professional grade microscope there's actually a lot of sort of prosumer type microscopes now that are just fine for those uses but they probably won't uh the home system you have probably wouldn't be enough for those kind of applications yeah and so those prosumer ones or the little bit higher quality they're going to have magnifications that are going to get us small enough to see things like bacteria and is there a certain kind of light you need for the fidelity when you're looking for that blue staining? So not necessarily a particular kind of light. Um, without, I mean, microscopes can get very complicated if you start really getting into the nuts and bolts. But what it really comes down to is the quality of those objective lenses. So the lenses that are, are close to the sample when you're imaging. And, you know, the difference between the microscope you bought your son versus, say, one that costs about 500 bucks is going to almost entirely be in those lenses. It's, I mean, obviously, a more expensive one will probably have a little bit better construction, but it's really those lenses that make the difference. And so when you're talking about a higher grade lens, it's going to gather more light from the sample. So for a given amount of input light, the sample will be brighter. Um it'll be free of what are called chromatic aberrations, which basically means if if a lens isn't built quite right, the red can get focused at a slightly different point than the blue, than the green. And that's where you start to now lose color because your colors aren't all being put into the same focus. And so you might get uh, something that's the wrong color because you know it should look blue, but the blue's not focused where you focused on the sample. And so now you don't see the blue anymore. Uh, and there's other factors as well that go into kind of the quality of, of the color fidelity in how the, the illumination light is being projected onto the sample. And so again, a, a higher end microscope will have better optics for actually getting the light onto the sample and making sure it's being illuminated in a way that's going to give you good color recover, or fidelity and good contrast is another thing as well. So uh, you'll notice on cheaper microscopes, especially at the higher magnification lenses, that the contrast isn't very good. And that again is kind of comes down to lens design and, and the design of that, the light path that illuminates the sample. Yeah. And, and when we look at the, the video series you've done on microscopes most recently, what are some of the things that you're trying to tackle in that video series? So it's kind of split into two parts. So it's a, it's a 10 video series and the, the first five um, take you through sort of the, the most basic parts of a microscope. So what are the different parts of it called? What do they do? How does it make an image? How do you, you know, safely change lenses and focus and all of those kind of things? Uh, and so if you've never used a microscope before, even before buying a microscope, I'd make a point of watching those five videos. And then I also have a blog post that goes along with that that kind of dives into what to look for uh, in terms of some of the optical qualities of the lenses and stuff. Um, 
for whatever type of particular procedure it is that you think you're going to want to do. And then once you have a microscope and you've played with it a little bit and you're kind of comfortable with it, then the latter half of my video series is on now how do you start using it in the brewery for looking at yeast, doing yeast counts, doing viability stains. So you can kind of pick and choose from those later videos uh, which ones to watch based on what it is that you would want to do. But really, before you buy a microscope or do anything, you really, I think, need to understand and, and have a good idea of what exactly it is you want to be able to do with the microscope and then to make sure you're picking a microscope that meets those requirements because uh, you know it's really easy to underspend by just 20 or 30 dollars and end up with something that's not sufficient for what you need and it's also really easy to spend far more money than you need to do what it is you're trying to do so i think understanding what you want to do first and what you need to do it is the most important step of the process yeah, I think a, a microscope's range is anywhere from about $50 to many thousands of dollars. And there's probably a little bit of everything in between, right? They go well over a few thousand dollars. So we have some at my work that are over a million dollars. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I mean, <laughs> but at, I, the, I, at the prosumer level, yeah, they get up to about three, four thousand at the higher end. Yeah, uh, I, I and, personally, like personally, I actually own an iPhone repair shop. And for doing micro soldering, we have a amazing microscope that i would never use for anything to do with brewing but yeah that that thing was probably five thousand dollars it was a huge piece of equipment and, uh, and i i teach a microbiology class at work and the the standard scopes that we use in those are are about five six thousand as well and if you can get one of those for home you know second hand for a decent price they're fantastic but it's a lot of money to spend for a new one if you're just doing it for hobby use exactly and, and when you talk to like a brewery, for example, and they're just starting out getting a lab. W what are some of the things that like the brewery level is trying to tackle with their lab in general? Well, I think the main thing that they at least should be worried about, I don't know that all of them necessarily worry about it, is quality control uh, and making sure that they're sanitizing things properly. So I've actually, with a few breweries, um, helped them get some of that up and running. And that's a little different. I haven't covered any of that really in my videos, but a lot of that is how do you do um, environmental sampling in a way that you know what you've sampled is actually what you're growing on the plate. So it's, it sounds kind of funny because you're looking to see if you have contamination in the brewery and your single biggest concern is actually contaminating your swab or whatever you're sampling with, um, not from the brewery equipment, but from something else, and then thinking you have contamination when you don't. Uh, so that's a little different of a concern than what you might have in a home brewery. But that's what I, a lot of breweries are leaning towards, and that's what a lot of breweries you know, probably should be doing if they're not doing it already. Yeah, because if you have a contaminant that you can't figure out where it's from, we're talking about many thousands of dollars you could be throwing down the drain, right, if you had a bad batch from that. Exactly. Yeah. Like the, the consequences of getting it wrong at their scale is very different than the consequences at my scale at the homebrew scale. I mean, I'm sure you have dumped a batch, right? More than one. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it doesn't happen often, but I've totally dumped a batch. I, I had, a, I, I actually in the last three years had this one batch that I could not figure out what was wrong with the flavor. It had to have been a contaminant of some sort or something wrong with the fermentation. And I, tr and, and as you know, there's always the tricks of try this, try that to try to salvage it. And you know, there's just, sometimes it's just a dumper. <laughs> At some point, some, some points you just have to cut it loose and try again. I mean, I do a lot of wild ferments and if you're going to go down that road, expect to dump a fair amount of beer because you know, probably one in 10, you know, can't even be blended into something, you know, you just have to, this is horrible, go away. <laughs> it tastes just like, it just has that baby puke flavor, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you get some really horrible tasting and smelling things once in a while. And, you know, it's, I think sometimes that sets people off of why I would I ever want to try that. But nine times out of 10, it's wonderful, right? It's that one time out of 10 where you end up with something that you now have to uh, dump and then clean really well before you reuse that equipment again. <laughs> yeah, I, I I have to admit that uh, that has totally happened to me. I when I first started trying to capture some wild yeast, I, I did a project where I just did you know boiled some wort in with some with some 
DME and did it in mason jars and left them throughout my my yard. And I had this one sample, and it still sticks in my head today that I left under an aspen tree, and it, pr- it had a and I put a airlock on top of it. it saw, saw that it was fermenting for a while, and uh, took a whiff of that, and it was a smell that I can never unsmell. <laughs> uh, they, you get some pretty rank stuff in some of those, and those ones that <laughs> straight down the sink. <laughs> yep, straight down the sink. Yeah. It was gone. Uh, you're just like. Yeah, what should black things be growing on this? <laughs> uh, that's actually a good point. So if you are trying to go down some of these roads, at this point you probably know what yeast looks like. It tends to, you know, sort of dark brown to cream in color. If you start to see things that are colors other than that, you probably want to dump it because even if it doesn't smell bad, it's probably not good for you. Yeah. Uh, and certainly anything that looks like mold in particular, you definitely want to be careful about. Yeah, definitely if it's furry, it's not good. <laughs> so uh brian uh what kind of things do you have in the works when it comes to brewing in general for you uh well so right now i'm working from home because of this uh, little virus that's going around uh so i'm i'm actually using this as an opportunity to uh, get my keyser full for the summer because i always seem to run out of beer in the summer um but nothing too exciting with those uh, just some uh, some dark loggers and some uh, like Scottish wee heavies and, or not wee heavies Scottish seven, 70 shillings and things like that. Uh, I have at any one time always a couple of wild ferments going. So I got a, a couple of sort of golden ale inspired things um, that have been one's been going on for about a year and a half now and the other one's probably about six months old. Um, and yeah, that's kind of it on the brewing front. I've got a few videos that I'm working on and my video production schedule is very slow so i don't know when those are gonna be coming out but i'm working on a working on a couple new videos and yeah that's really it right now that's awesome uh yeah speaking of the covid19 and in the kind of state of the world i i did a, a a twitter survey last week and randomly i asked hey are you brewing more are you brewing less and, and kind of asked that question and surprisingly people are act, are telling me they're brewing more and anecdotally for my friends, they're saying, Hey, I'm at home. I've got nothing better to do. I'm, I'm working obviously, but you know, I, I definitely have more home time than I've had. And I can tell you that at least all my brewing friends and me included are brewing more than I've brewed in years. Uh, would you say that kind of feels the same way to you? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, my my son's relatively young, but certainly since he came along, you know, I've went from brewing probably 25 batches a year to in a good year, maybe 13 or 14. Uh, so I'm definitely making up for lost time right now. I've, I've already got a few done this year and I've got a few more coming up in the next couple of weeks. So, you know, that should should help get a few more into the, the keyser this year than in, in the past couple of years. Yeah, uh, it, I I kind of always joke that uh, I'm the one guy that because I had kids, I started brewing. Uh, I I've always been a very social outgoing person. And once you have a baby, right, you, you stay home a lot more just because you, you, you have to, and you've got to help out around the house. You have to, you know, I, I want to be a good father, those kinds of things. And in doing so, I was like, well, I don't go out as much as I used to. I guess I'll just figure out something to do in my garage and started really brewing. Right. And, and I brewed a bit before, but that's when I really started home brewing and getting into it. So it's, it, I'm kind of the opposite. Whereas most of my friends that have kids are like, yeah, I don't get to brew as much as I used to. And I'm the opposite of like, man, I started brewing a lot because I had kids. So kind of funny. <laughs> uh, well, it kind of depends on how time works out. Right. Yeah, totally. And, and I did a lot of very, very early in the morning batches, like 4 a.m. and be done and wrapped up by 8 so I could hop in and do what I needed to do or uh, a lot of late night batches that were, you know, hey, kids in bed at 8 o'clock, let's uh, knock out a quick batch before I go to bed. So yeah, that's just how kinda... a lot of my brewing is. It's either early Saturday morning or late Saturday night. Exactly. Well, I, I want to thank you for coming on the show. I'll definitely make sure that we put links to brian's website we'll also put links to his youtube channel in the show notes so if you if you want to take the deep dive i highly recommend at least watching some of his youtube videos it's super informative and i have to say brian you you do an amazing job of explaining the process in in really an easy way that people can digest very easily and make it very approachable 
So if, if you're listening to the show and you really want to do a, a deeper dive into some of the things that Brian's doing, please look at our show notes. We'll, we'll link to that. And uh, I just want to thank you for being on the show and, and really informing us uh, about some of the scientific things you could do at home. Well, thank you for having me and uh, letting me ramble on for an hour or whatever it's been. I'd like to thank Brian for taking the time to be on today's show. I had a great conversation, and as always, whenever I have a guest, I just learn so much. It, it's really a great time. If you want to follow Brian or find out more about his website and some of the cool things that he's doing on his YouTube channel, head over to our show notes. I'll have all of the information listed there. You can also get more detailed information from our website, homebrewingdiy.beer. You can also follow us on social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Just look for the handle at homebrewingdiy. Well, that's it for this week, and we'll talk to you next week on Homebrewing DIY.